Hello, my name is Alan Katzin. I'm an Associate Professor of Physiotherapy and the Head of Laboratory of Physiotherapy at the Faculty of Health Science, University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. In this presentation, we will review physiological mechanisms and treatment strategies of pain-driven atrogenic muscle inhibition. So what is atrogenic muscle inhibition and how it relates to muscle weakness? Atrogenic muscle inhibition, shortly AMI, is a disruption of neurological function that develops after joint injury and diminishes ability to fully contract the musculature surrounding the injured joint. It is a common clinical occurrence and it's often a major barrier to full patient recovery in rehabilitation. AMI is hypothesized to be a protective mechanism one that limits movement and forces of the injured joint to safeguard it from further damage, which is of course functional in the acute or in early stage after injury or surgery. However, failure to eliminate AMI timely through the rehabilitative process can render even the most well-intentioned therapeutic exercise program ineffective. AMI plays an important role in development of muscle weakness and muscle atrophy. On a picture here is an example of a severe muscle atrophy of the entire leg that developed after knee surgery. The AMI, AMI has been demonstrated in several conditions, among them ACL injury and ACL reconstruction, meniscectomy and meniscal suture, knee osteoarthritis, patellar tendinopathies, acute ankle sprains, chronic ankle instability, and chronic low back pain. The AMI is most studied in people with ACL rupture and surgical reconstruction. Therefore, the majority of the scientific ev evidence presented here is based on this population. Now let us look at the pattern of muscle weakness that develops following ACL reconstruction. First, we have to establish that the most affected, the most inhibited muscle is quadriceps femoris. About 18 up to 45% of quadriceps femoris strength deficit develops by fourth week post-surgery. So this is the early period when uh, the muscle weakness develops. Afterwards, uh, the weakness is slowed down and progressively the strength is improved, but the recovery is very slow. Less than 10% of preoperative muscle strength is gained by 12 week post-surgery. Even afterwards, uh, the muscle strength often does not fully recover. So we can observe in many cases, six and up to 30% of uh, muscle deficit up to one to six years post-operatively. In some cases, in, in some patients, even uh, for, for lifetime. So there is a um, muscle weakness for lifetime if nothing is done about it. Development of muscle weakness, uh, especially if it's chronic, uh, if it becomes chronic, deteriorates lower limb kinematics and joint control. So it clearly affects function of a knee and of the entire lower limb. So-called knee stiffening strategies develop, which are clearly seen during level walking, walking up or down the stairs and other functional activities. What we can observe in such patients is that they are um, not using the full range of motion, so the leg, the knee appears stiff, although passive range of motion um, is normal. So there is no obstruction of passive range of motion in the knee joint. But during walking, during during uh, weight bearing, uh, muscle are muscles are guarding the joint and it appears as stiff. So there is no no full extension and there is not enough flexion 
uh, a limp develops, so people are limping, um, some more obviously and some more subtle, uh, but uh, the longer this pathological pattern persists, the more difficult uh, is to relearn normal kinematics. So we have to uh, we have to start with the treatment as soon as possible and not wait um, that this pattern becomes uh, really stubborn and really um, imprinted in, in patient's brain. Another interesting thing that needs to be mentioned here is that uh, in as much as 50 to 70 percent of all patients, um, the inability of full quadriceps femoris activation is bilateral. So not only the injured, the uh, reconstructed leg is affected, but also the other leg uh, is affected and is not uh, able to fully uh, develop muscle uh, contraction. This is important, of course, uh, because uh, often we evaluate muscle weakness based on the comparison with the so-called healthy leg. So we calculate deficit or limb symmetry index based on the difference between injured and non-injured leg. But knowing that both legs can be affected and not only that they can be, they often are both affected, this comparison uh, is not really reliable. We have to keep this in mind when assessing and uh, evaluating our patients. This is an example of individual recovering from anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction in the context of international classification of functioning, disability and health framework. In this scenario, the magnitude uh, by which altered body structure which is anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, affects patient's function, shown here on the left, patient activities, and patient participation. As you can see, all three are interconnected. These may be further influenced by social factors, such as healthcare services made available to the patient and social support systems, but also personal factors such as self-efficacy, locus of control, physical activity level, gender or age. Other environmental and personal factors can of course also contribute to this scheme. Now let's review the, the mechanisms that contribute to the development of muscle weakness after joint injury. The first mechanism is a disused muscle atrophy, which is a physiological response to reduced limb loading and reduced overall physical activity, which always occur when we are injured. In some people, there is also change in Overall, pro, uh, overall protein intake, so they change their diets, they change their overall food intake, and these three all contribute to the development of muscle atrophy, which is characterized by reduction in muscle mass and also reduction in muscle quality. So muscle mass is reduced due to decrease in myofilaments, membrane and globular proteins, and in chronic cases of, of atrophy, also a uh, reduced number of cell nuclei. On the other hand, muscle quality is underpinned by changes in motoric end plate function, decrease in capillary network density, decrease in mitochondrial function. First, there is a decrease in uh, the number or concentrations of um, mitochondrial enzymes. Later on, the number of mitochondria itself can be reduced. Uh, some fiber type conversion also appear, 
And again, in chronic cases, fatty infiltrations uh, start to appear in muscle tissue. The second mechanism is arthrogenic muscle inhibition, which is the end product of all neurological changes that are triggered by joint injury. The triggers, uh, which I often refer to as the forerunners of the apocalypse, are joint swelling, proprioceptor loss, also named deafferentation, so the loss of mechanoreceptors within um, the injured tissue, for instance, ruptured ligament or tendon. Pain, we all know that pain is a very potent um, inhibitor of muscle contraction. If we provoke pain during contraction, we get instant decrease in uh, muscles, muscle uh, force. And inflammation, which is of course closely connected to pain, but it has been shown that uh, inflammatory factors per se irritate chemoreceptors uh, in injured tissue and contribute uh, to the atrogenic muscle inhibition. So these four altered afferent input um, trigger first spinal reflex inhibition of a muscle, but they also change cortical somatosensation and um, trigger, trigger changes at the supraspinal level, which will be explained in more detail on the next few slides. Of course, arthrogenic muscle inhibition and muscle atrophy are interconnected. Uh, we know that arthrogenic muscle inhibition directly affects muscle atrophy. So if um, the activation of the muscle is reduced, the atrophy is augmented, but there might be that uh, it's also vice versa, so that the muscle atrophy, um, chronic muscle atrophy, contributes to the vicious cycle of arthrogenic muscle inhibition. We know little about this and needs to be studied in future experiments. So what are the mechanisms of reflex arthrogenic muscle inhibition at the, at the level of the spine? We will review this nice hint published by Rice and McNear in 2010. Again, this is an example of inhibited quadriceps muscle uh, in a patient with ACL reconstruction or ACL rupture. So the middle of this hint shows the spinal uh, reflex pathways, which we will focus on. Uh, and at the bottom are the four factors driving those reflexes. We know these factors already, the four riders of the apocalypse. So pain and inflammation, swelling, joint laxity, and proprioceptor damage due to the injury of um, the tissue itself. So the first reflex that is triggered primarily by pain and inflammation is flexion reflex. So when the patients are extending the injured knee, the pain gets worse. So the pain increases and this triggers a withdrawal reflex, which means that the antagonistic muscles become active and preventing full extension. This is a part of the knee stiffening strategy that I explained on a previous slide. So, uh, so increased activity of um, knee flexors also inhibits the excitability of alpha motor neuron of the quadriceps. So we have inhibition effect on the quadriceps. The second reflex mechanism is driven primarily by swelling. Joint swelling have been shown uh, to 
reduce one B afferent fiber discharge. So there is less uh, discharge from one B um, afferent fibers toward the spine. And this has direct connection to the inhibitory neuron within the spine, which connects to alpha motor neuron of the um, quadriceps. So we have a direct inhibition triggered by swelling. The third mechanism, the third uh, reflex, uh, reflex pathway is a little bit more complex. It's called gamma loop dysfunction, which refers to the function of gamma motor neurons of the uh, muscle spindles. As you know, muscle spindles are small organs uh, within the muscle, which have uh, various functions. Uh, the key function is this uh, sensing of um, muscle stretching, um, which is of course uh, sensed by the 1A um, afferent neurons. So um, the stretch reflex is the cause of the uh, of the um, 1A uh, afferent fiber activation, but muscle spindle is more than that. Muscle spindle also contains intrafusal uh, muscle fibers, which are basically muscle within the muscle, so a small muscle fibers within the muscle, and the function of this uh, small intrafusal muscle is to um, to regulate muscle tone, the overall muscle tone. Uh, so, as any other uh, muscle fiber, also intrafusal uh, fibers have uh, their motor neuron, and this is called gamma motor neuron. So, the gamma motor neuron, the activity of gamma motor neuron regulates the, um, the tension or the, the contraction of the intrafusal uh, muscle fibers, and by doing so, it also regulates the overall muscle tone, so of the entire muscle. The, the mechanism is, of course, more complex. It also, um, it also uh, comprises uh, supraspinal uh, mechanisms, but um, the alpha uh, motor neuron is strongly affected by the activity of um, uh, muscle spindles. And if we have a receptor damage, so the damage of the uh, afferent fibers, the 1A afferent fibers, we get the inhibition of gamma motor neurons. So the tone of the intrafusal muscle is reduced and hence the overall um, skeletal muscle tone is reduced and reduced muscle tone has a direct inhibitory effect on its excitability. So this is the third reflex mechanism that contributes to the inhibition of quadriceps muscle. It must be emphasized that the combination of altered efferent inputs, so if we have all these factors present together at the same time uh, is more potent in inducing arthrogenic muscle inhibition than either one in isolation. And of course, we are talking about the reflex me mechanisms, which are not under voluntary control. So we cannot um, voluntarily override them and say, okay, now I will contract, I know that these mechanisms are present and I will nevertheless fully contract the muscle. Of course, we cannot do it because they are reflex uh, mechanisms uh, at the spinal level, so very simple reflexes, uh, rather simple reflexes, uh, and we have to use other techniques, so-called disinhibitory techniques, which, which we will talk about um, in the continuation of this presentation, to sort of override this um, reflex pathways. Uh, the 
spinal level of uh, arthrogenic muscle inhibition is very active at the early stage after injury or surgery and becomes less active in more chronic cases. Uh, we'll see uh, there is quite a lot of uh, literature, a lot of evidence uh, present that these spinal reflexes um, are even more active become more active so um, uh, they uh, sort of help in um, in uh, activating the muscle in the chronic stage we'll talk more about this on the next slides now let's look at the broader picture of development of arthrogenic muscle inhibition this picture was published in a recent excellent review by Lepley and Lepley 2021. As you can see there are roughly five uh, mechanisms leading to a chronic arthrogenic muscle inhibition. We already know number one and two which is um, responsible for the early phase of the arthrogenic muscle inhibition so the, F, the changed efferent information uh, that drives spinal inhibition of the quadriceps muscle in this case. So we have spinal loops we reviewed on a previous slide and this is active in the early phase up to six weeks post-surgery or post-injury. Later on um, the development of supraspinal mechanisms start, starts to appear. So in long-term AMI, which is considered more than six months post-surgery or post-injury, neuroplastic changes and cortical re uh, reorganization starts to appear. So these are mechanisms under number three, four, and five. So basically it's, uh, the, the inhibition is becoming chronic very similar to a chronic pain and um, there are several events that start to appear at the uh, supraspinal level. So the first thing is increased activity of frontal lobe cortical areas which are responsible for motor planning. We start to think more how to perform movement, how to use our injured leg um, in order to uh, preserve at least basic function. So we, we start to uh, plan more uh, how to get over obstacles, how to walk down the stairs, how to accelerate or decelerate the speed of movement, how to turn corners or pivot on our injured leg. and uh, we need to do this because we have less efferent information. So these same triggers that drive the spinal uh, loops of inhibition are also responsible for uh, changes in the sensory processing at the somatosensory cortex. So less efferent information to the brain means um, more difficulties with planning our movement and that is why we need to activate uh, more our frontal uh, cortex and especially the areas responsible for motor planning and think more about movement. The second uh, mechanism uh, is inhibition of motor cortex by other areas. We already mentioned the frontal cortex area, so this is one area that that uh, sort of inhibits motor cortex activity, uh, but our other areas of the brain also contribute. For instance, cerebellum, the small brain, which is of course uh, connected also to um, balance, um, basal ganglia, and of course the somatosensory uh, cortex itself. Due to reduced uh, proprioceptive information, we increase our reliance on vision. 
of course, we if we don't have enough information on how the joint is moving, what are the forces that work on the joint, uh, what is the acceleration of the joint, how strong is a muscle uh, contraction around the joint. If we lack all this information, we sort of start to use other information to compensate. And vision is the first uh, that we rely on. So we, we look more um, where to step, uh, how to perform the movement. And uh, of course, this is something that becomes automatic. We are not, um, we are not aware of it. But of course, we can get aware of it. So uh, um, during treatment uh, of arterogenic muscle inhibition, one important aspect is to, um, to draw attention of a patient to their greater reliance on vision. So we can manipulate vision in order to emphasize more reliance on proprioceptive signals again. Okay, remember this. Another mechanism which happens is uh, decreased motor output to the aff uh, affected muscles. Um, so, um, because of the inhibition of motor cortex, of course, the motor cor cortex decreases motor output to the affected muscles. So, you can see the blue line here going from motor cortex down to the alpha motor neuron of the quadriceps and adds to the spinal inhibition which is already in place. So this contributes to the uh, final uh, inhibition of the muscle. Um, a concomitant mechanism is also reduced reciprocal inhibition of the antagonist muscles. This is part of the um, flexion reflex that I explained on a previous slide. So we know that uh, already at the spinal level, there is increased activity of the antagonistic muscles. So the withdrawal reflex, we are guarding the knee, do not allow full extension because extension is painful. Uh, and we have the spinal loop of increased antagonistic muscle activity. However, um, this is again not shown on, uh, directly on this picture, but this is again um, uh, augmented by a supraspinal mechanisms, and uh, which basically means that also at the level of motor cortex there is reduced um, reciprocal inhibition of the antagonist. Uh, so when we are trying to activate uh, quadriceps. Normally, in normal condition, if there is no uh, arterogenic muscle inhibition, of course, uh, the antagonistic muscles, so the flexors, are inhibited because we don't want them to contract at the same time as we contract quadriceps. This is not functional. But um, when we have arterogenic muscle inhibition, um, the cortex does not inhibit the antagonistic muscles in the same way, so we, uh, we don't get the full uh, inhibition of antagonistic muscle, which means that when we are activating quadriceps, there is still quite a lot of activation of the flexor muscles. So we have a sort of co-contraction, which uh, guards the knee, uh, but of course this is uh, not functional for for the quadriceps muscle. Quadriceps muscle cannot activate fully if uh, antagonistic muscles are uh, still active. In cases of uh, very chronic and very persistent arterogenic muscle inhibition, so if all these um, mechanisms that we review up till now, now are not uh, resolved uh, in, in timely manner and they are not uh, addressed by, by uh, um, physiotherapy uh, and other um, therapeutic uh, uh, methods, um, there can be uh, 
change in morphology of uh, the neurons and of course these changes are becoming uh, irreversible we don't want to get to this point right um, so there is uh, evidence in in the literature from the exper experimental uh, uh, data that um, axon degeneration and also demyelinization of corticospinal pathways um, starts to appear so we lose our axons and myelin sheets uh, which is of course detrimental for the function of um, corticospinal pathways so for the motor uh, motor pathways and um, if we get to that phase um, probably we cannot um, get the full recovery anymore yeah uh, and the longer the uh, arthrogenic muscle inhibition persists uh, the more important become behavioral and emotional changes. So uh, we start to develop very similar strategies, behavioral and emotional strategies, uh, as with chronic pain. So fear avoidance start to appear, kinesiophobia. Um, we reduce our self-efficacy um we are losing external focus of control and so on and so forth so uh, this is a sign of a chronic condition and our behavioral and of course also emotional adaptation in in a way of uh, uh, fear for our uh, for our joint for our um, well-being uh, fear of movement uh, kinesiophobia and this is um, of course a sign of a chronicity uh, which means that uh, we have to act prior to these events in the next slides we will review um, some of the um, potential uh, treatment strategies for uh, for treating arthrogenic muscle inhibition so what about the morphologic changes at the level of skeletal muscle so how does atrophy affect the muscle um, on the left here is the mri scan of thigh cross-sectional area approximately at the mid mid thigh and uh, on this scan you can see cross-sectional area of all thigh muscles in the middle is a femoral bone this black circle here and area uh, on this side so this area here is the quadriceps muscle down here this area are the hamstrings so the flexors of the knee and this wedge in the middle so this part are uh, the adductor muscle of, uh, muscles of the hip. So in healthy people, it looks like this. There is no damage to the uh, joint and there is no damage to muscle tissue. So the muscle looks, um, um, has an even uh, color it looks dense and it looks toned um, and there is not a lot of subcutaneous tissue this white uh, stripe surrounding the muscle so there is not a lot of subcutaneous uh, tissue in the muscle on the right here is an example of atrophied thigh muscles uh, in a case of osteoarthritic knee joint so in, in a patient with uh, osteoarthritis, chronic degeneration of the joint, and also, of course, chronic um, muscle weakness. And uh, it is clear that the cross-sectional area of the muscle itself uh, 
is substantially reduced. So there is less muscle, less muscle tissue, and uh, we can also see that there is much more fat tissue surrounding the muscle, but not only surrounding the muscle, we can see the white areas also within the muscle, and these white areas are also a combination of uh, fat tissue and uh, connective tissue. So the muscle looks different, not that uh, that it's only smaller in size, but it looks different. It doesn't have a, the same tone. You can see from the picture that it's sort of um, sort of wrinkled, and um, there are these wide areas in the muscle, which means that um, not all of the muscle contains um, contractile proteins, but they are replaced by um, fatty infiltrates and connective tissue infiltrates. So this muscle is not only smaller, but uh, it's also um, of lesser quality. So if we were to calculate force production per square centimeter of this muscle and compare it with this muscle, the same force production per square centimeter, we would get much smaller number, which means that um, the muscle is of lesser quality. It cannot produce as much force per same cross-sectional area. And remember this, uh, because uh, if th this condition uh, is very long-term and persistent, um, the changes some changes are irreversible, the same way as changes in uh, neurological system that we reviewed on previous slides. Uh, so we really don't want our patients to get in this phase because uh, such muscles, such degenerated muscle uh, cannot be fully recovered. We have to interfere prior to uh, to this phase, so we have to uh, start treating muscle as soon as possible and prevent um, such chronic atrophy and such chronic degeneration of a muscle. This diagram summarizes pathogenesis of muscle weakness after joint injury. So all the mechanisms that we reviewed in detail on previous slides. It was published by Leplin, Leplin 2021. So joint injury causes immediate immobilization of the joint, or at least unloading or partial, partial unloading of the joint, which triggers disuse muscle atrophy and directly adds to muscle weakness. At the same time, joint injury causes deafferentation, so loss of proprioceptors, and all the other uh, triggers of altered efferent input that we talked about. Together, they trigger first reflex motor inhibition at the spinal level, so this is the early phase of um, arthrogenic muscle inhibition, but at the same time it also impairs somatosensation. If the um, condition persists for a, a long period, neurocognitive compensation starts to appear, which are further upgraded by psychological adaptations. So all these four mechanisms, both in the early and late phase, decrease motor output of a muscle, hence directly contributing to muscle atrophy, and of course, um, augmenting muscle weakness. So, the muscle weakness changes biomechanical and motor control, uh, causes biomechanical and motor control alteration. So our movement uh, becomes different. We change our gait. We start to behave differently. And because of it, our function is reduced. But also uh, the risk of re-injury is increased. And so the vicious cycle is closed.